On this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast, weekly wins and 2022 predictions. Welcome to the Crushing Debt Podcast with your host, Florida attorney Sean Yesner, where our goal is to help you get rid of the financial bullies in your life. So welcome back to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. My name is Sean Yesner, owner and founder of Yesner Law, and we made it. We are at the very, very end of 2021, looking forward to 2022. And so what I thought I'd do is uh, wrap up the year here and talk about my predictions for what's going to happen to the real estate market, foreclosures, bankruptcies, all of that stuff into 2022. Now, before I get there real quick, I want to mention one more time our sponsor, Sam Cohen of Attorneys First Insurance. And so if you are an attorney or title company and you need errors and omissions insurance, malpractice insurance, or if you know an attorney or title company, please refer them over to Sam Cohen over at Attorneys First Insurance. He can give them an apples-to-apples comparison. And what I really like about Sam is that he's not a high-pressure salesman. If he can uh, do better, then he will give them the rates to do better. If he can't do better, he'll tell the attorney or title company that he can't beat what they currently have. And so Sam is very honest in that capacity. Uh, He's very knowledgeable about malpractice insurance for attorneys and title companies. And so a great way to support The Crushing Debt podcast would be to support our sponsor, Sam Cohen of Attorneys First, and a great way to support him would be to refer to him a title company or an attorney that you know uh, that is due for renewal of their malpractice insurance. You can reach Sam at his email, sam at attorneysfirst.com, or at the website, which is just attorneysfirst.com. So, a couple things I wanted to talk about in this week's episode. Many of you know from previous episodes, longtime listeners may know from previous episodes, that one thing that I do consistently is that at the beginning of the year, so or at the end of the previous year, so as we get into these last couple of days before the end of the year, I map out what goals I want to accomplish in the following year. And then what I do is I write those down, and then every month I pick one to work on. And then every week, I pick a goal that will support the monthly goal, and then every day I pick a goal that will support the weekly, that will support the monthly, and then I write down what I want to accomplish during the day to support all of that. And and the concept is it's six things that I need to do. I can't go to bed until all six of those things are done for the day, and that helps me be highly, highly productive. I've used it to eliminate debt. I've used it to get my budget under control. I've used it for various uh, different things. And so if it's a system that you want me to explain further to you, uh, please contact me, sean at yesnerlaw.com. No no sales pitches, no nothing to buy. Uh, I simply just get, you know, a generic notebook and and that's what I write everything down in. And so I can help you uh, show you my system and then you can use it as you see fit if you want to use it exactly as I do uh, or if you want to use it in a different way. But what it does is it allows me to knock out a lot of my annual goals. I accomplish a ton during the year and it's all small incremental steps. And so if you're interested in getting out of debt in 2022, if you're interested in making more income in 2022 or beyond, if you're listening to this episode, uh, you know, sometime in 2022 or 23 or 24, and you want to work on some of these goals, please, please contact me and uh, and let's work through it. Um, no charge. I'll, I'll give you what knowledge and information and systems I have, and I hope that you can uh, get those things accomplished for yourself. One of the other things that I do, however, and I've mentioned this as well, is I track, so I have five uh, work days of the week, Monday through Friday, and then on the sixth page, so that I always start you know, fresh on the same page in the book, on the sixth page, I track what I call my weekly wins. And so those things that I've accomplished during the week that I'm particularly proud of. And, and it can be something as simple as I had a, a lunch meeting with a referral partner or I won a hearing, or I finished a book, or you know something, but but anything that I can pick up on during the week. And then what I'd like to do around this time of year is go back and look at all the weekly wins and see what I accomplished during the year and what I was most proud of during the year. And I even highlight some of them. And it gives me a good moment to start to carry momentum into the following year, to kind of look back on the year in review and reflect. And so 
I'm not going to go through all of those weekly wins, but some of those weekly wins are things that I do want to mention on the show because they relate to what I do. And so I want to talk about some of the things that I'm most proud of. I think maybe about one per month that I'm most proud of and sort of translate that into, you know, more about what I do, more about what the law firm does, more about what the law firm wants to accomplish as we finish out 2021 and get into 2022. When I'm done there, what I'll do is I'll get into uh, some goals or some predictions rather for 2022 in terms of the foreclosure market, the bankruptcy market, that kind of stuff. So let me start here at the beginning of the year in January. In January, I won uh, an eviction hearing. Now, if you recall, in January of 2021, we were dealing with the CDC moratorium and we were dealing with a freeze on foreclosures and evictions. And so the CDC at the time, the U.S. Center for Disease Control at the time had an affidavit that a tenant could complete and submit in court that would prevent an eviction from being filed. Well, in this particular case, uh, our tenant uh, did not comply with the affidavit. They were being evicted for a reason other than a failure to pay rent due to COVID. They were being evicted simply because their lease had expired. It had terminated by its terms. It had nothing to do with a failure to pay rent, an inability to pay rent, a loss of income due to COVID. had nothing to do with any of that. This particular tenant was simply being evicted because their lease had ended, I believe, in October of 2020. And so it took us until January to have this hearing in front of the judge. And we did, and we showed the judge that the affidavit didn't apply, and we won the hearing, and we were able to get this lady out, this tenant out for our landlord client. Now, interestingly, she ended up, the the tenant ended up filing some other things that that caused some trouble for the landlord, but we were able to navigate through all of that, uh, and uh, probably by by about the first quarter of the year, uh, this tenant was completely out of the landlord's life entirely. And so it was a pretty good win. The the landlord, uh, our client, was an elderly woman who herself was having some financial difficulties because this tenant had refused to pay rent after the eviction started, uh, which was another of the grounds that we used to sort of get her out, is that she wasn't paying the rent to the registry of the court. Uh, and, and our client was suffering a little bit because of, you know, some of the emotional trauma, some of the trauma that she was under from trying to get this house out from under this tenant. But we ultimately were successful. And so that was a big win uh, for January. In February, I had another landlord client of mine who had filed an eviction lawsuit and the tenant filed a, a claim against the landlord because the tenant was claiming that the landlord did not properly return all of the security deposit. And so it's interesting. Florida law says that the landlord can impose a claim on the deposit, and then the tenant has a certain period of time to contest the landlord's claim against the deposit. But then Florida law really doesn't say what happens after that. In this case, the tenant ended up suing my landlord client to contest that they should get their deposit back. Now, it was a small claims case because it was less than $8,000. And although we tried to settle it, my client ultimately instructed us to go to trial. And so we had a Zoom trial. I think it was my first uh, Zoom trial in terms of questioning witnesses and introducing evidence. And I've had a few others during the course of the year. But it was my first Zoom trial. And we prevailed uh, in that case as well. We were able to show that the tenant did not, in fact, comply with the lease agreement entitling the landlord to withhold the money that the landlord did withhold from the security deposit, uh, and we won. Now, part of that win also entitled my client to a recoupment of attorney's fees, but what I tell a lot of my landlord clients is, especially in a situation where a tenant is forced to leave or has to leave, the ability to collect money from that tenant post-eviction is going to be slim to none. And so, unfortunately, my client won, but didn't really recover any money other than the security deposit they had already held on to. But we now have a ruling that says my client was correct in withholding what they did from the security deposit, and so tenant loses. And so for February, that was a big win for me. This is a, uh, an institutional landlord client that sends me probably 10 to 15 evictions a year, uh, you know, one or two every couple of months. And uh, so we were able to do a really good job for this client. It's a low-income housing provider, which uh, getting this particular tenant out allowed another uh, low-income family to move in. 
to the to the housing. So that was a good thing. And so we were really able to do some good for this client. Uh, in March, now I try as I was looking back through the year, I tried to keep uh, some of these weekly wins to things that would impact, uh, things that would speak to what I talk about in the podcast itself. Uh, but March, I got a little a little personal. So in March, we moved to our new office. Now, those of you that are in the Tampa Bay area, we were in a building. We're in the same building that we were two, three years ago when we moved in first into that building. Uh, we're in the same building. However, we had outgrown our space upstairs. Uh, my associate attorney, Lauren, was in a conference room. I had multiple legal assistants in the front entryway. I had this huge office that was acting as a conference room and an office because the conference room was taken by the associate attorney. And, and it really was not uh, a good workflow uh, in terms of communicating inner office and doing that kind of stuff. Well, a space downstairs became available, which added about 500 square feet. But not only did it add some square feet, it also gave each of us our own space. So I have an office, a smaller office, which is fine. Lauren has an office, and then my assistant Terry has an office. We each have our own offices. We can shut the doors. Uh, we can uh, talk in private with clients or, or with each other or whatever. And we've got a conference room now. So yesterday I did a mediation, and uh, we were able to sit in the conference room with the clients on Zoom to perform the mediation. So a little bit of a personal win uh, for me in March. We were able to move downstairs. It did bump up the rent a little bit, but uh, you know, fortunately, we didn't have a huge, huge spike in annual expenses from 2020 to 2021. So uh, it, it's something that is uh, clearly affordable. And one of the things I may talk about as we get to the end of this episode is what I have planned for the law firm in 2022. But for March, the big thing in March was that we were able to expand and and grow the office from about a 900 square foot space to now about a 1500 square foot space. And uh, it has improved efficiency. It has improved communication. Uh, I love the space. Don't necessarily love the building, but it's good enough for now. And the space is, is great for what we need for now. So in April, I brought a partition lawsuit. Well, I brought the partition lawsuit earlier than that, but we actually won the hearing in April. So this was a situation where brother and sister on, on one side are my clients, and then the other sister on the other side is the defendant. And brother and sister want to sell the house, and sister does not want to sell the house because sister can live there basically for free. Uh, and so we started a partition lawsuit. The three siblings inherited this house from their parents, and uh, two of the siblings want to cash in. The third sibling wants to stay there. And so we filed what's called a partition lawsuit. Basically, we asked the court to split uh, the proceeds, to order the sale of the house and split the proceeds. Now, in April, we won that hearing, uh, allowing uh, the sale of the property and now the split of the proceeds. Now, interestingly, here we are in December, as I record, and we're still sort of um, fighting with the defendant. Uh, sibling who still lived in the house and so now what we're trying to do now the property has sold and we're trying to do we're trying to figure out how we're going to split the proceeds the defendant sibling wants to split it one way and my clients want to split it another way and we can't agree on how to split it so we just yesterday filed a motion to schedule a hearing in front of the judge to bring all this evidence in front of the judge and support our theory for how the money should be split uh, if the judge agrees, the title company can simply disperse the proceeds or whatever the judge ultimately rules. But that's the biggest issue in a partition lawsuit. It wasn't really difficult to have the court order the sale of the property. Where things get difficult and what took eight months of negotiation and we still haven't resolved is how we're splitting the money once the property has sold. And so that's the big issue that we deal with in partition lawsuits. But I think we'll be able to work through it just fine. Uh, I've got all my evidence of what each of the particular siblings has paid. That was how I determined what should be split. And, uh, and we'll bring that all up in front of the judge. We'll see what the judge says, and I will keep you posted. Uh, in May, I had another hearing that I won on a landlord-tenant issue. Now, this one was interesting because my client was sued in small claims court for something that should not she should not have been sued for the landlord was sued for something that didn't really impact her didn't really impact the tenancy didn't really impact the lease uh, the the tenants that had moved in were moved in by other people so landlord rents to tenant 
tenant then subleases to new people. Those new people then sued my landlord client for some kind of made up breach, whatever it was, and filed in small claims court. And so I was able to bring a motion to dismiss the lawsuit and get my clients dismissed. And we had that hearing in May. And so, you know, again, as landlords, as tenants, you really want to be careful about who you're leasing to, and you want to make sure that your leases say no subletting. And if you do find that there are subtenants in there, you want to address it quickly if they're not allowed, because you agreed to rent to tenant A. You did not agree to rent to tenant B. Uh, tenant B may not have qualified for one reason or another. And so if you see that there are subtenants in your unit, uh, there's things that we can do to not only get those subtenants out, but uh, in this particular case, in this hearing that I won in May, insulate the landlord from liability from those subtenants that they were unaware were living in the house. And now in June, I had taken on years and years and years ago, I had taken on a case where my client is a contractor and was hired to do some work in the client's house and did the work, but the client wasn't satisfied with the work. And so the client sued, or the, the homeowner sued my client contractor uh, for poor, alleged poor performance uh, on the job and has refused to pay. And so that has devolved into a lawsuit that went years and years and years and years. I mean, it's it's got to be, I think, a 2017 or 18 case, and here we are almost in 2022. And so we mediated this dispute in June, and I almost settled it. And, and now why do I call that a weekly win? Because I think I got it to a great place where it should have settled. But for whatever reason, my client, the other side, uh, just wouldn't uh, engage with the settlement that we had uh, ended up negotiating. And so the settlement never happened. Now, interestingly, just in the last week, uh, I got an order from the court scheduling this case for trial. So the the thing that the reason I wanted to bring this up in today's episode, you know, a lot of times when I analyze whether things should go to trial or not, what I look at is, well, how much is the client being asked to pay in settlement? And how much are they going to have to pay me to go to trial? Well, the thing about this case is that what they're being asked to pay in, in settlement funds is far, far less than what the client's going to end up paying me to go to trial. And the problem is when you go to trial, you really never know what the judge is going to say. I can be confident in my case. I can uh, know my case backwards and forwards, but the judge may rule the other way. And, and I don't have any control over that. I only have control over arguing the best case that I can. And so if the client had agreed to settle, they are in control of the resolution, where if we rely on the judge, there's no guarantees. So as you all are out there looking at different settlement options, if you're talking about settling with a creditor over debt or you're talking about settling, I'll talk about uh, what I did yesterday in terms of another lawsuit that I handled. When you're looking at settling, also ask yourself, well, if we don't settle, what's it going to take to get this case across the finish line and how much could I be exposed to or how much could I recover if we do that? So the problem is, even if I win at trial, my client may not be able to recover the fees that they pay to me. Now, I don't mind making some money. I got a mortgage to pay and a family to feed too. But is it the best alternative for me to take a bunch of money from my client, maybe win, maybe lose, where they could have paid less to settle the case back in June and the case would be over? Now we're looking at trial in March of 2023. And so they're going to have to pay me to take this thing to trial where it could have been done in June of 2021. So when you're reviewing settlement options, those are really some of the factors you need to consider uh, as well. Now, in July, this one I, I added, uh, even though it wasn't a win, it was actually a loss. But I had a trial in July that I ended up losing. The reason I included this in a weekly win is because it was a trial related to fallen trees on a piece of property. And so I had done a blog post and I had done a podcast episode years and years ago with uh, our friend Rich Fika from Florida Coastal Insurance. And the topic of the show and the topic of the, of the blog was whether a landowner could recover for a damage from trees that fell onto their property. And the issue is you can really only recover if you know the trees are 
diseased or or in bad shape and you give notice to the neighboring property owner, the neighboring property owner doesn't do anything about it, the trees fall on your property causing damage. Well, we thought we had had a fact pattern that did that. And so we did end up having to go all the way to trial. And fortunately, the judge disagreed with us. Uh, the damage was after one of the hurricanes had come through in Florida. And basically what the judge ruled was that the hurricane was the primary cause of the downed trees and the damage, not the disease of the trees themselves, not the condition of the trees themselves. But the reason I wanted to include this is because it was a great example of a podcast episode and a blog post that generated business for the law firm. And so, you know, as if you're listening to this near the start of hurricane season, that is definitely something you want to look into is how are the trees doing on your property? How are the trees doing on your neighbor's property? Do you need to give any notice that those trees need to be uh, taken care of, that those trees need some TLC? And then for those of you that are podcasters or content creators, look at creating content that people want to hear, people want to listen to that could end up generating either SEO or business or whatever for you. So that's why I wanted to include this as a win, even though the result of the trial itself was a loss. Uh, I think the win was good uh, because you know we were able to accomplish something with what we had done. Uh, and even though we didn't get the, the result the client wanted, we gave it our best shot. We, we did the best we could do. And again, the judge ruled against us despite what we thought were really, really good facts. Uh, in August, I had a bunch of debt settlements. And so in August, I was able to settle for a client. She had, uh, I think, five or six different creditors, and we were able to settle each one $20 a month here, $50 a month there, uh, $35 a month here, $75 a month there. Now, I had encouraged this client to file bankruptcy because even though we were able to settle each of the debts, it still adds up to a couple of hundred dollars a month over all these payments. And so my thought process was bankruptcy is probably an easier solution than, you know, nickel and diming someone to death over these little uh, settlements. But the client didn't want to file bankruptcy, which is fine. And we were able to settle a lot of these debts, you know, again, 20 bucks here, 30 bucks there, 50 bucks here, 100 bucks there. And we were able to settle uh, all of these debts for the client, and she was able to avoid bankruptcy. So I felt that was a win. Uh, also had a case, you know, I mentioned with the client in June who refused to settle. Well, in August, I had a client who chose to settle, and it was on those grounds. It was, a, it was an analysis of, well, if I don't settle, I'm going to have to pay a lot more money. We're going to go to trial. There's the uh, danger of incurring attorney's fees of the other side if we lose. Now, again, my fees would have to have been paid if we had won. But again, the risk and what the judge might say and the complexity of the case, this client said, you know what, I'm going to spend a couple of grand now to get it settled rather than pay Sean more than that for the question mark of what the judge might say. Now, again, I'm confident in my case. I'm always confident in my cases. I won't take them on otherwise. But you never know what the judge is going to say. So I think this client made the correct decision. And even though it was a little bit more than what they wanted to pay, this case was settled in August and they get to enjoy the end of the year and next year uh, in peace rather than have this trial hanging over them. So again, consider the consequences of settling and consider the consequences of not settling. Uh, September. Now, September is another personal one. Uh, in September, I really got back into running. Now, those of you that, that have listened at least for the last couple of weeks know that I got a diabetes diagnosis uh, back in October. Good news is the doctor's officially taken me off of insulin. I'm now just controlling it with diet and pills. And I think having had the diagnosis, my attitude was I'm not going to rely on the pills to get my blood sugar down. I'm not going to rely on the insulin to get my blood sugar down. I'm going to rely on diet and exercise to get the blood sugar down and use the pills and the insulin as a supplement. What I seem to notice here is that some people who are diabetic, and, and to each their own, I'm, I'm really not saying this from a place of criticism, just a place of observation. What some diabetics will do is they'll say, well, I can keep eating the way that I've been eating because I'm on insulin and pills. And unfortunately, I don't think that's the right solution for me uh, because 
It was eating like garbage that got me into this scenario in the first place. And so if I continue to eat like garbage, at some point the insulin and the pills are not going to work anymore. I had to change my diet for the pills and the insulin to work. And I had to change and be more consistent with my exercising. And so in September, I got back to running. Uh, again, I, running is one of those hobbies that I do uh, to keep myself busy, to keep myself uh, in shape. And I was able to get back to running in September. Now, the good news there, you know, when I first got back into running, I was very, very, very slow. I was still dealing with the effects of having high sugar and high blood pressure. Now that my sugar's down, now that my blood pressure's down, both my stamina and my speed have increased. Uh, I think when I first got back into running in September, I was running like 17, 18 minute miles. Uh, and then this last time I ran here earlier this week, I was down to about a 12 and a half minute mile. My goal is to get down into the 10 to 11 minute mile range and then increase it to three or more miles. You know, 3.1 is a 5K. So, you know, again, a little bit personal for me, but it was a win in that I had started to get my exercise under control. I had started to get my sugar under control. I got back into running, which is something I really enjoy doing. Uh, and so to me, that was that was a, the, a big win uh, in September. Uh, similarly, in October is when I got the diagnosis and when I started uh, the insulin shots. Now, again, as I record this in December, the doctor has uh, taken me off of the insulin shots. I am only doing pills. And so the reason I included the insulin shots for October as, as my win is because, number one, I was able to get off of them. But number two, shots and needles are a huge, huge phobia of mine. In fact, as I record this, I'm just done uh, at the uh, lab getting my blood work done for the doctor for the next round of sugar levels, A1C levels, all that kind of stuff. And even though it didn't hurt, it, you know, it, it's what everybody says. I felt a little bit of a pinch. There was a little bit of pressure. Uh, after about 60 seconds or maybe even less, the needle was out, the bandage was on, and, and I was on my way home. And so the whole thing, start to finish, was a big nothing. But sitting there in the chair as the tech was preparing all the needles and the vials and all that kind of stuff, I was literally shaking, literally shaking. Um, because I was so nervous about just having the, the blood work done. And so if you want to become a diabetic, but you're afraid of needles and can't swallow pills, diabetes is absolutely the wrong disease for you. Um, but one of the reasons that I included uh, the insulin shots as a win for October is it helped me get over some of these phobias. You know, I can now swallow bigger pills where I couldn't before. Uh, I have to prick my finger twice a day to monitor my blood sugar. Uh, I had to give myself insulin shots and basically prove to myself that I could overcome my phobias. And so what fears and phobias do you have and what can you do during the year to overcome them? Now, again, I'm not suggesting that if you're afraid of needles, you eat like garbage so that you get diabetes and you have to deal with needles. That is not at all what I am suggesting. But if you have fears, if you have phobias, uh, attack them. Attack them head on and do what you need to do to overcome those fears and overcome those phobias. Nothing is really ever as bad uh, as it seems. You know, there's always positives. There's always silver linings. Uh, there's always some good to take of any scenario, even if it's just how you react to that scenario, which is, I think, what happened to me in this diabetes diagnosis. So what good can you take of everything else that's going on in your life? What lessons can you learn? What fears and phobias can you overcome just by living your life uh, on a daily basis? And so that's why I included that one as a win for October. In November, another long-term case that I was able to bring to conclusion, which was a really, really good thing. Now, in this case, I had a client who was a uh, subcontractor, but he wasn't a licensed subcontractor. He was basically a workman for another contractor, and he had been hired as a handyman to do some work for a homeowner, and the homeowner stiffed him on the bill, and so we sued to get him paid. But then the homeowner brought up that he wasn't licensed. And so the Pinellas County uh, authorities got involved and he actually went into a criminal case. My client got arrested and was being charged criminally with doing construction work without a license. Now, I was able to refer him to Bridget Domingos, who has been on the show once or twice before. I know I did a special episode with her 
uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And uh, Bridget was able to defend him and get the charges dropped. So Bridget did a fantastic job there. And then it came back to me, and we ended up suing, not under the lien theory of the construction law, but we sued under what's called a quantum merit theory. In other words, we sued based on a theory of fairness. If my client did the work, then he should be paid for the work that he did that did not require any special licensing. And the judge agreed with us. Now, we didn't get every penny that we asked for, but we did get a judgment of a few thousand dollars, a little bit less than what we were asking for, but still got a judgment that now we can record that now affects any property that these uh, homeowners own, their real estate investors, that I do think scammed my client. And so we're gonna we're in the process of recording that judgment now to create a lien against uh, these investors' other properties, and we'll see what damage we can do there. Maybe we can file some kind of of judgment foreclosure against some of these other properties that they may own throughout Tampa Bay, and try to get my client uh, paid that way. But again, this was truly a win uh, in that we won the trial and we got my client some money after being stiffed uh, by these real estate investors. And so if you are an investor treat people right. I mean, that's really all you have to do is treat people right, and you'll avoid a lot of the problems that some of these uh, investors get into. The last one is is December, and it's interesting because I'm recording this in December. I'm actually recording it the day before it comes out, so hopefully my editor is uh, working and we can get this episode to you first thing in the morning. But uh, yesterday, I attended a mediation with another client of mine, a property manager client of mine. And the simple facts here... Uh, my property manager clients managed a, a rental property. The tenant fell uh, in the rental property and sued not only my clients as the property managers, but as the but also sued the property owner. And I got involved pretty late in the case. The property managers had another attorney. That attorney uh, wanted out, so I substituted in. And uh, the mediation was yesterday. Trial was scheduled for uh, I think March or April of of 2022. And so we went to mediation yesterday, and it was exactly the same scenario that I was talking to you about. The clients paid a little bit more than what they originally wanted to pay, but they were going to pay me much more to take it to trial. And the problem with this case was that there was no attorney's fee provision. This was a personal injury slip and fall case. And so if I had won, there may not be an attorney fee provision. Now, I had filed uh, settlement proposals and whatnot that may have triggered Uh, me getting some attorney's fees out of the other side if we had won. But the problem there is the other side was injured in a trip and fall accident. They were on social security disability and pension. All of their income was uh, protected from garnishment. So even had we won, and even if I had gotten an award of attorney's fees, collecting those fees would have been a totally different and probably nearly impossible task. And so the clients decided rather than plunking money into the defense of this lawsuit that we may or may not recover, let's just pay the other side what we call some go-away money and uh, and get this case resolved. Now, the uh, interesting issue there is that there was another party involved, you know, the landlord, and so we had to sort of coordinate and work with the landlord, and there was some danger as to whether we we would be adversarial to the landlord because of the property management agreement. But here's the interesting thing. At the beginning, the first offer out of the plaintiff's attorney was six figures in damages. But because the, the plaintiff had Medicare, Medicaid, they had only had about low five figures in actual medical bills. And we were actually able to settle for less than that. So we settled for way more than what my clients wanted to pay, but we settled for way less than what even a minimum judgment would have been had the plaintiffs won at trial. And so for that reason, my clients were super happy. Uh, It was a great win for us. And apparently now I handle defense of personal injury lawsuits so uh, because it was real estate related, I got involved, uh, but it was interesting to uh, see a personal injury case from that perspective. You know, why was I involved? Basically, there was no insurance, uh, I think, from the homeowner, and definitely uh, my client didn't have uh, an insurance policy that would have covered the slip and fall accident, nor would any property manager, really. They're not, they're not insured against slip and fall accidents in properties that they manage. That's what the homeowner's insurance is for. So... 
Uh, that's why I got involved, got experience uh, in uh, medical, got experience in personal injury, got experience in trip and fall. And so a great little tool to add to the toolkit as we get into 2022. And speaking of, what do I see coming in 2022? Well, as of this recording, the student loan moratorium has been extended into May. It was set to expire, I believe, at the end of January 2022, and the Biden administration has extended that into uh, May of 2022. So until, I think, June 1, there's still no payments due on federally backed student loans, no interest accrual. Uh, if, if you are on one of these loans and you do decide to pay it, you are chunking down principal. And so that would be a fantastic idea to reduce your student loans. No word yet on whether the government, the administration, or Congress is going to do any type of forgiveness of student loans. We don't know that information yet. And there's still no information yet as to whether Congress is going to make these loans easier to discharge in bankruptcy court. But uh, we have made a lot of inroads into student loans in terms of trying to negotiate them. Uh, especially in bankruptcy court, out of bankruptcy court. And so if you're dealing with student loan issues, know that those may be on hold depending on the type of student loan you have until May. Uh, If not, reach out to our office. If we can't help, we've got a couple other attorneys that we've interviewed on previous episodes that we can refer you to, and they can definitely help you, especially if you're uh, outside the state of Florida or outside the Tampa Bay area. We've been hearing for, gosh, since COVID started, that there's a foreclosure wave coming. There's a bankruptcy wave coming. Now, we haven't seen either of those things. But what do I think in 2022? I don't think there's a real estate bubble. Uh, I think there may be a correction. I think interest rates may go up. I think inflation is going to continue because we've got to start paying back some of this deficit. And the only way to do that really is with inflation. We're not going to do it with income tax revenue to the government. So I think inflation is going to continue. Now, I do also agree that inflation in some areas is going to be more than inflation in other areas. And I'm not necessarily talking about the physical location. I'm talking about the industry location. So inflation in terms of in terms of uh, groceries, in terms of utilities, in terms of Um, gifts and consumer goods. You know, inflation may be different depending on what type of category of expense you're talking about. But I don't see any way uh, to do this instead of, except for inflation. I've heard that after the midterm elections, we could really see a spike in inflation. We could really see uh, a spike in interest rates as the Fed tries to start to get some of this even more uh, under control. And so I don't see a bubble. I don't see the type of bubble that we had in 2008, 9, 10. And even if there is a bubble, a lot of the houses now have equity where they didn't uh, in the Great Recession, in the mortgage crash, where a lot of those properties didn't have equity. A lot of the properties today do have equity. So I don't really see a crash, but I see a correction. I do see an increase in foreclosures in 2022. I do see a resulting increase in bankruptcies in 2022. Now, keep in mind, bankruptcies flow from all the normal conditions that we think of. So, you know, someone gets a divorce, someone loses their job, someone uh, has a medical condition or a medical issue, somebody becomes disabled. You know, for any number of reasons, people's income can drop. And when that happens, not only does foreclosure become uh, more prevalent of an issue, but so does bankruptcy. And so I do see a lot of these factors maybe starting to add and pile on top of each other, and I do see an increase. And in fact, today, I see old foreclosure cases firing up. The Florida court system here has put procedures in place to clear out some of the backlog. So I do see that going on into 2022. Is it going to happen January 1? No. Uh, But maybe first quarter, second quarter is when things might start to uh, get get a little traction, you know, pick up a little steam. Uh, And so those are my uh, sort of overriding 50,000 foot overview predictions for 2022. But I want to know what you all think. Uh, You know, what do you think? And it'll be fun to listen to this episode this time next year and see what happened with those predictions. You know, what goals are you going to set? What things do you want to accomplish in 2022? So that'll do it for this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. That'll do it for this year's episodes of the Crushing Debt Podcast. I very much appreciate you all listening, giving me your time to listen to my ramblings and my thoughts. Uh, I do really appreciate it, but please communicate with me. Let me know what you think. Uh, What goals have you set for 2022? What do you think is going to happen in 2022? 
If you want my system for setting and tracking goals, uh, please let me know. It's free. I'll, I'll have a conversation with you or an email exchange with you and give it to you. Uh, but that's it really for this week and this year's episodes of the Crushing Debt Podcast. We will be back next year, 2022, the first week of the year, uh, with another episode. And I look forward to talking to you then. In the meantime, I hope that at the end of the month, you have more money rather than at the end of the money, you have more month. Have a happy and safe new year, and we'll talk to you next year. If you have questions that you think would make a great topic for a future episode, please email Sean or connect with us on social media. Sean Yesner and Yesner Law PL are Florida licensed attorneys. The information contained in this week's episode is not a substitute for legal advice. Your situation may differ, especially if you are located somewhere other than the state of Florida. If you have questions, please contact our office or contact a local attorney. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. Podcast.